morning church. Um, I'm going to read uh, Romans 12 um, from the Christian Standard Bible. Um, and um, this is the word of the Lord. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is true worship. Do not be confirmed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. For by the grace given to me, I tell everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he should think. Instead, think sensibly, as God has distributed a measure of faith to each one. Now, as we have many parts in one body, and all the parts do not have the same function, in the same way, we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. According to the grace given to us, we have different gifts. If prophecy, use it according to the proportion of one's faith. If service, use it in service. If teaching, in teaching. If exhorting, in exhortation. Giving with generosity. Leading with diligence. And showing mercy with cheerfulness. This is the word of God. Yeah, thank you, Church. My name is Lesejo, and I have the privilege of serving the body of Christ through Fellowship City as elder. This morning, I have the privilege of sharing the Word of God with you. We have spent five weeks already in gospel fluency. The series is about how the gospel should permeate every fiber of our being and how that should overflow into different aspects of our lives. Fam, we're going through the series because we want the gospel through the Holy Spirit to take root in our hearts, to convict and to encourage us. We have looked at the gospel bringing unity, diversity, and maturity. This is the first episode. Then we looked at what the gospel is. Then the gospel is my life was the third episode. The gospel around the table and the gospel with us was last week. If you missed any of these sermons, please catch these up on YouTube or your favorite audio podcast platform. This morning we look at culture, the gospel and culture. Before we dig in, we need to understand the word culture. There will be an image behind me that will describe the word culture. Culture is described as the arts and other manifestations of human intellectual achievement regarded collectively or can, can be described as the ideas, customs, and social behavior of a particular people or society. So then culture is your view or way of life as an individual and importantly the community, as it does affect the community. Culture speaks of what we place intrinsic value on and it speaks of our attitudes. Hidden Figures is an American movie first released in 2017 about three women with the main star as Taraja P. Henson. So, they are mathematicians and they join NASA. Kevin Costner stars in the film as a leader at NASA. Catherine, who is played by Taraja P. Henson, works directly under Kevin Costner, and she's brilliant at math. And all three ladies were instrumental in the early years of the US space program. So there are many layers to this movie. But in many ways, the three black ladies are brilliant. They join a men-dominated and white cultured organization. With Kevin Costner, they swim upstream against culture to change the narrative of culture from a race, sexism, educational perspective to main a few. I don't believe I'm about to do this, but let me take a breath and go for it. Uh, Arsene Wenger was appointed in 1996 by Arsenal. He came from France. I don't believe I'm doing it because I am a Chelsea fan, and it, the word Arsenal doesn't roll off the tongue. Um, <laughs> But Arsene Wenger joined Arsenal, and he came from France and arrived with different ideas about the culture he believed should exist. He basically changed the English football landscape. He started relying on science rather than tradition to build up his team and fitness. He was the first coach to field 11 players of different nationalities because he wanted technical ability to play to his style. He changed eating less sugar, less fats, and more vegetables. 
He was specific about how to chew the food as well. That's how deep he went while changing the culture. So he changed the culture. He was countercultural. Culture is a big word, especially standing on a pulpit on a Sunday morning. Fam, I believe some listening on YouTube or audio podcasts or sitting here this morning would fit into certain spectrums, such as believing that we should not speak of culture in church or that we should only speak of a gospel culture. And you may be wondering, where am I going this morning? Just saying the word culture would be enough to maybe raise hairs on some people's neck. I'm going to ask that you don't check out this morning, that you stay with me as we navigate this word, as we navigate the gospel and the implications thereof. We will see this morning that we are born into a culture. Culture exists. We will also work through a different culture we experience and adopt at rebirth as believers in Jesus Christ. We adopt another culture which in many ways is countercultural. so some of the cultural spectrums we are born into. We grapple this morning with what this means for us, being born into another culture at rebirth, a culture that should transform us as individuals and also transform those around us. Let's pray. Lord God, King of Kings, the one who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, we are thankful that this morning we can gather as your people, as your children. We can stand in awe of your splendor and majesty. We can sing of the truth that you give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. We can behold your splendor and enter your courts. This morning, Lord, would you settle our hearts and minds as we come to your holy word? Would you remove any distractions, including our minds, our fears, and our biases as we sit together under the lordship of your word? Would your Holy Spirit continue to move, awaken our hearts to you, and what you would want us to know, to say, and to do? Would your name reign in our hearts? Would you wash us with your mercy and grace as we encounter Jesus walking through the pages of scripture this morning? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Church, this morning what you should not hear is that culture is bad. Culture is good and culture is necessary. Culture is the flavor, the essence of who we are. What does the gospel say about culture? We will this morning be reminded that as Christians we ought to understand the differences of the culture we know at first birth and the culture that we inherit at rebirth. Culture is important. However, what culture is the question. We ought not to throw away the baby with the bathwater here. However, we ought to make sure that we understand what our culture is and what it should be. This morning we have three points to understand culture. Culture at first birth. So when we navigate culture at first birth, we'll look at the Bible overview and how that speaks into culture at first birth. Then we'll look at culture at rebirth. Then we'll zone in on Romans 12. And then we'll look at gospel culture from Romans 12 as well. To understand culture and its importance, we have to understand the whole Bible narrative. Culture at first birth. In Genesis, we see the creator God creating man, and he says it is good. Man is then born into the world. Man is to be fruitful, and man is to multiply. Man is to have dominion over the world. Man is to work. Culture is the undertone of people. It can be seen or expressed in what we do and how we do it. I do not disappoint, so there will be a picture of food behind me. It can be expressed in what we eat. You sh- you'll see a poiki, me- that poiki, which is meat made in a black cast iron pot. I am not sure if different colors exist, but let's stick with black for now. So black cast iron pot. Um, and it should not be stirred, otherwise it's a stew. Um, or you'll see a cook sister behind me. Um, uh, dough that's fried till golden brown and enjoyed with some syrup. Or you will see melkos behind me. Um, a sweet breakfast porridge. I must say, after having it for the first time, I thought I had just eaten a milk tart, which was not set. (laughs) First thought that was that my mom would not give me sweets for breakfast, Um, but I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the milk. Or chakalaka and acha, a welcome tradition to pap and brai meat, although not not exclusive to pap and brai meat. Culture can also be expressed in our beliefs, like a sangoma, witch doctors or African doctors, some would say, or star signs, like placing meaning to a period of time that you are born. Culture can also be expressed in our dress, um, like Cavella, a shoe known to the Pretoria streets, um, or a K-way jacket. Um, 
it is so it is so popular you could believe that some cultures give this out at birth um, or a khaki brook um, I'm still waiting for my extra short pair from Peter Vessels. <laughs> Culture can also be expressed in our values, some of which I just shared, but, but include words like indodaikali, a man doesn't cry, or munna a man isn't asked questions, or a bur makaplan. Um, there's a direct translation coming. I know it's not going to be like, so the direct translation is a farmer makes a plan. Um, but I know that you could use it in different ways. So a burmaka plan. Culture can be expressed in our habits, like a married couple has a man sleep closer to the door. I wonder what that means for the windows. Um, or, 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 taking, or taking off shoes when you enter the house. Um, I guess some could say it's the carpet. Um, okay, culture is the essence of who we are. It makes us who we are. Adam and Eve had a culture to be fruitful and multiply to have dominion over the earth, to work. That culture would also have shifted over time. The fall happens in Genesis 3, and we see an individualistic culture building from rebellion and sin against God. God, through Noah and the ark, saves only a few because of how bad the world had turned to be with people disobeying God. Fast forward Israel. God's chosen people have their own culture, a more family-orientated view than individualistic, very community-driven. They practice sacrifices and cultural rituals to God. I also wanted to say that they moaned, groaned, and cried, but let's not go there. So, so fast forward again, we see God call Abraham to the land of Khan. The promises that follow from God is that Abraham would be the father of many nations, and he would be blessed. Abraham and Noah were called by God. We will come back to this idea of God calling people because we'll see a few more people called by God. We see culture and practices develop. The Jews have practices that include meeting in the synagogue, that include circumcision, that include food and following the Torah, the word of God. They can't fulfill the law, and when they break the law, they bring sacrifices for atonement for breaking the law. Fast forward then. King Jesus is born. He follows the practices of the culture of the Jews as he's born into that culture. So far you should see that culture was there from the beginning. It was good and it continued to develop. Jesus himself was born into culture. Jesus calls people from different cultures to follow him. Called Simon, called Peter, Andrew, James, John, Saul and then Paul and many more that Jesus calls who would have different cultures. So culture is good until it comes into conflict with our new culture that we are born into and we receive Christ. Jesus came born of a Virgin Mary to redeem us from God. He saves us from eternal separation from God so that we are God's children. We are not disqualified by our identity or culture, but rather we adopt a new identity and a new culture. This new identity along with the gospel doctrine should empower us as believers through the Holy Spirit. What makes us transcultural fam is acknowledging, understanding, embracing our differences, even in culture. But then we ought to transcend and create one new culture in Christ, the culture at rebirth. When we transcend culture, it doesn't mean we abolish our first culture at first birth. We still acknowledge, understand, and embrace the differences in culture. But when this is against our culture at rebirth, then we have to consider what our, what our second culture says. It needs to transform us our second culture at rebirth. Romans 2, verses 25 to 29 says, Circumcis Circumcision benefits you if you observe the law, but if you are a lawbreaker, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. So if an uncircumcised man keeps the law's requirements, will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? A man who is physically uncircumcised but who keeps the law will judge you who are a lawbreaker in spite of having the letter of the law in circumcision. For a person is not a Jew who is one outwardly, and true circumcision is not something visible in the flesh. On the contrary, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is of the heart, by the spirit, not the letter. That person's praise is not from people, but from God. This is a prominent Jewish tradition. Circumcision is part of the covenant of Abraham, a sign identifying the descendants of Abraham. This is a culture of the time. What is countercultural is because of the death of Christ, circumcision of the heart is more important than any physical circumcision. If the Holy Spirit dwells in you, that is true circumcision. 
So our culture, let's expand on our culture at second birth. So what is this new culture that we transcend into? This new culture at second birth? These are all great questions. Let's look at Romans 12 to navigate this. So Romans 12 starts with the word therefore. Therefore is a conjunctive adverb. A conjunctive adverb is a part of speech that connects two clauses or statements. There you go, fam, some English lessons as well for this morning. So what comes before? Here's a young overview of Romans. So Romans is is an epistle authored by Paul while in Corinth. Chapters 1 to 11 can be broken into three parts. Each of the parts can be looked at with the words, the gospel. So basically, the gospel influences each of these three parts. Chapter 1 to 4 speaks about God and his righteousness. So the gospel reveals God's righteousness. This part has a strong theme on justification. Justification is the act by which God moves a willing person from the state of sin to the state of grace. So Romans equates a new status, a new family, and a new future as a result of this justification. We are now one big faith-based ethnic family from the lineage of Abraham because of Jesus Christ and not the law or following the Torah. So chapter 5 verse 8 has a theme that the gospel creates a new humanity from Adam through Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ offers his life as a gift so that we can have the new humanity. Romans 9 to 11 has a theme of the gospel fulfilling God's promise to Israel, which is a covenant family as descendants of Abraham. So Jews and Gentiles are now part of one family. They're unified as the church. So let's look at how this unification comes about. Therefore, remember the conjunctive adverb links the gospel bringing new humanity, the gospel fulfilling the promises of Israel, unifying Jews and Gentiles with the mercies of God. We see in verse 1. Mercy can be described as compassion or forgiveness from someone who has the power to punish or harm. Remember this as we're going to use this word a few more times today. The mercies of God enable the Gentiles to be now under the covenant of grace. They are also a new humanity. Paul is saying the root or foundation of what is to come is because of the mercies of God when he uses this word, therefore. The mercies of God are the gospel bringing new humanity, the gospel fulfilling the promises of Israel, unifying Jews, God's covenant people, with Gentile, those who were outside, previously outside God's covenant and people. The word mercy has significance here, and we'll come back to this repeated word. So verse 1 says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. What does this mean? To unpack this, we need to start at, at true worship. This whole passage, Romans 12, 1 to 8, describes the motivation of our true worship and the how of our true worship. The motivation of our true worship is the mercies of God. Because of the mercies of God, we can present our bodies as a living sacrifice, and this will be pleasing to God if we do so because we are motivated by God through his mercy. The how is in giving God all of ourselves The reference to bodies here refers to all of our being, all our mind, our heart, our hands, our thoughts. But how do we give God all of ourselves? Verse 2 has an answer. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. The renewing of your mind here is the only way to give God all of ourselves through the Bible, through the Word of God. The Word of God which will reveal the mercies of God to us. Worship isn't just about music. It's everything we do, everything we think, everything we say to honor God and make His name known. So true worship is giving every fiber of our being to God because of His mercy and because of His love, through the regeneration that comes from His Word. This is part of our new culture at birth, that we have the mercy of God and we live lives of worship to God. Verse 2 also has a negative and positive statement. So do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. The negative statement is do not be conformed to this age, and the positive is be transformed by the renewing of the mind. 
What does this mean? Is Paul saying we should look at all that is being done in the present age, look at culture that exists, and then turn 180, 180 degrees away from it? Is Paul saying you ought not to wear an all-star because everyone is wearing it? Is Paul saying you can't buy an iPhone because that's the fruit of choice, I mean the phone of choice? I hope not. I think part B of verse 2 gives us the answer. The renewing of the mind will help to discern what is good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. The NIV translation says, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. So we should be able to discern, to test what is good and pleasing, or what good would approve, what, what God would approve. We can only do this through the continued renewal of the mind and continued gospel regeneration. So the words do not be conformed to this age is related to discerning what of this age is not good, pleasing, and perfect. So if the culture says it is okay to be in this temple or a polygamous marriage, we ought to test that and approve if that's within God's will. And if it's not God's will, we should not conform, church. In Genesis, we see God un uniting two people through the covenant of marriage. That is the right design from the designer himself. Otherwise, we would have seen Adam, Eve, and Eva or Evelyn. However, we see that the two shall become one. It was only Adam and Eve that God unified. If culture says it's okay to give sacrifice and worship the ancestors, as well as God, we have to go to the Bible. Exodus 20, verse 3 to 6 says, You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commands. Hebrews 9 verse 27 says, And just as is it appointed for man to die once after that comes judgment. This means we ought not to conform to offering sacrifices and worshiping those who have passed on. They have passed on. They have faced judgment. If culture says, a man isn't asked questions, is that what we see of Jesus? We see Jesus ask many questions and he responds in love, mercy, and in compassion. Men, that should be our culture. Not to shy away from being asked questions. Questions aren't disrespectful either. We ought, to respond, we ought to respond in mercy and love. If culture says you are a superior culture, you ought to again test if this is good according to the Bible, if this is pleasing to God. Galatians 3 verse 27 to 29, For those of you who are baptized into Christ have been clothed with Christ. There is no Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female, since you are all in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed, heirs, to, heirs according to the promise. Then, fam, we should not conform to this belief that there are superior cultures. Our new culture at rebirth says we are all one in Christ. Verse 3, for the grace given to me, I tell everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he should. Instead, think sensibly as God has distributed a, me distributed a measure of faith to each one. Now, as we have many parts in one body, and all the parts do not have the same function in the same way, we who are many are one body in Christ, and individual members of one another. According to the grace given to us, we have different gifts. If prophecy, use it according to the proportion of one's faith. If service, use it in service. If teaching, in teaching. If, exhort, if, if exhorting, in exhortation. Giving with generosity, leading with diligence, showing mercy with cheerfulness. What should be important for us to understand here is that different gifts in different measure have been given to each of us. The gifts themselves should enable the, bod the growth of the body of Christ, the growth of the church. We all contribute in whatever God has given us. So it's important that we are all using our gifts as we may be stifling the body of Christ. Using our gifts is also a part of worship unto God. We should also see that we ought not to think highly of ourselves than we should. This is under our new culture at rebirth. Maybe our old culture at first birth decides which culture is better. Some cultures say that Sutu is the most romantic language, or Tosa culture believes they have the most beautiful woman, 
or the most beautiful culture. Um, Zulu culture is assertive and they think of themselves better than other cultures, specifically if your name is also Zulu. Or, or the Afrikaans culture thinks they are superior culture. Here again, fam, we should be discerning what is good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. And if we do, then we will realize that the culture we have at rebirth says we should not think of ourselves more highly than we should. We are all part of one body of Christ. We have grace given to us. We can't boast for our salvation. Our culture at first birth doesn't guarantee us anything. Only the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross for us is enough for salvation. We see the word mercy again here at the end of verse 8. We should be showing mercy with cheerfulness and applying our gifts. Paul first, that, Paul first says that God, God showed us mercy. Then he's now saying, in our living as vessels of honor for God, we ought to use our gifts, not boastfully, as salvation is not from God, but act mercifully with cheerfulness. Paul is not only saying we should be merciful because God is merciful. He also models mercy in his approach. Paul starts off by saying, Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Paul urges us. In some translation, it uses the word appeal. Now, Paul is an apostle. He could command us, as this is what the word of God says. Philemon 1, verse 8 to 9, Accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man, and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus. So Paul uses a softer approach. He shows mercy in his approach. He shows love in his approach, even though he's an apostle with authority. He also calls them brothers and sisters and puts himself in and under the mercies of God with them. So he too is modeling this culture of mercy that he's saying and urging us to model. Our third point, gospel culture. At rebirth, we receive a new culture, a culture that is rooted in the mercy of God, the mercy of God in a new humanity, a justification for those who were previously not people of God. Now as, now as people of God, we should be a merciful people, a loving people, a discerning people, discerning what is good, pleasing, perfect will of God, a people who give and give generously, a people who bless those who persecute us, who weep with those who weep, a people who don't repay one evil for another, a people who associate with the lonely, a people who give of themselves wholly and completely to God as a living sacrifice. This gospel culture doesn't mean we denounce our culture at first birth. It means we discern what is good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. It means we now become a Jew to the Jews, a Gentile to the Gentiles, and bring the word of God to the culture we know. We don't conform to our culture at first birth. We acknowledge it, we embrace it, and by the power of the gospel, we transcend it, forming one new culture, one new community in Christ. Let's look at two examples from Jesus where he transforms culture with mercy and love. John 4, verse 1 to 26 is a parable of Jesus and a Samaritan woman. Jesus speaks to the Samaritan woman and asks for water. The Samaritan woman is shocked because culture causes a divide between Jews and Samaritans. Jesus in verse 13 says, Everyone who drinks from this water will get thirsty again, but whoever drinks from the water that I give him will never get thirsty again. In fact, the water I give him will become a well of water springing up in him for eternal life. Jesus shows mercy and love to the Samaritan woman in speaking to her. He then shows mercy and love as well in showing her that she was indeed looking for love, satisfaction in the wrong thing. Jesus shows love and mercy to someone of a different culture. Jesus functions within the gospel culture, not the culture of the day. We ought to have that very same gospel culture permeate through our being, church. Luke 19, verse 1 to 9 Zacchaeus, the chief tax collector, he climbs a tree to be able to see Jesus among the crowd. Jesus walks by and, and sees him and says that he will stay at his house. The response from those around can't believe this. Jesus now is going to associate with a sinful man. Verse 8, but Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, look, I give half of my possession to the poor. Lord, and if I have exhorted anything from anyone, I'll pay back four times as much. Today, salvation has come to this house, 
Jesus told him, because he too is a son of Abraham, for the son of man has come to seek and to save the lost. So Zacchaeus was a man that culture labeled as a sinful man. He encountered Jesus and wanted to give away his wealth and make, the right, make right the wrongs he has made. Jesus shows him mercy and love. You'll see a slide behind me, Church of, of Gospel Doctrine. The doctrine of grace creates a, a culture of freedom. The doctrine of regeneration creates a culture of humility. The doctrine of justification creates a culture of inclusion. The doctrine of reconciliation creates a culture of peace. The doctrine of sanctification creates a culture of continuously transformed life. The doctrine of glorification creates a culture of hope and of honor. The doctrine of God creates a culture of honesty and confession. Fam, true gospel doctrine should create a new culture at second birth. People should look at Fellowship City and see a gospel-centered disciple making a transcultural family. They should see a gospel culture rooted in the gospel. They should see a merciful, loving, discerning people, a people who don't conform to the cultures or views of the world but stand firm in the gospel. A people who understand and know the cultures of the world but bring the gospel to transform with, where the culture of second birth needs to reform. If someone walks through Fellowship City and they feel condemned, then our gospel culture does not match our doctrine. Or some, someone walks in and feels that we're an arrogant, prideful bunch of people, then our culture doesn't match our doctrine of regeneration. Would we be saturated by the word of God, church? Living in community and be shaped by living out the gospel where God has placed us. Would this gospel doctrine take root in our hearts and lives? Would it be important to us to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and to live out of that? So some, some reflection questions for you, church, this morning as we, as we close. How, how do you spend your free time? When last did you speak your faith to someone else? Are you merciful, loving to others? Is Christ real to you? Can your closest community affirm your answer? Can they back you up? Have you adopted the gospel culture and does it permeate through you? If you were to picture all your aspirations, hopes and plans for the year that are in a box and you were to open the box to inspect what is in the box. Does Jesus and the gospel feature in that box? Is God a main actor or priority? Or is he just in there to help you achieve what you want to achieve? Here's a quote from John Piper. If you don't feel strong manifestation of the glory of God, it is not because you have drunk deeply and are satisfied. It is because you have nibbled so long at the table of the world. Your soul is stuffed with small things and there's no room for the great. Let me read that again, church. If you don't feel strong manifestation of the glory of God, it is not because you are deep, you're drunk deeply and are satisfied. It is because you have nibbled so long at the table of the world. Your soul is stuffed with small things and there's no room for the great. Gospel doctrine without gospel culture is hypocrisy. Or gospel doctrine with the wrong culture is hypocr hypocrisy. Gospel culture without gospel doctrine is fragile. Gospel doctrine plus gospel, power, gospel culture is power, church. This is power to impact individuals a power to impact communities, a power to transcend culture and create a new community that makes the name of Jesus great. Let's pray. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Lord, we stand before you in complete adoration that you are Lord and God, that you have made a way for us to have direct access to you through the forgiveness of our sins on the cross of Jesus Christ. You have included us in the promise of eternal life because of what you have done and nothing of ourselves. 
You show mercy, you show love, you are love. You are faithful and kind, and we see that in the person of Jesus Christ. This is part of the culture that you desire for us, to be a people that are merciful, that are cheerful, loving people, a giving people with great generosity, a people who are able to discern what is good, pleasing, and perfect will of God, that we would be transformed by the regeneration that comes from constantly being washed by your holy word. Would you give us a great desire for your word? Saturate us with your word. Would you make us your vessel? Would you make us an offering? Would you make us whatever you want us to be? Would we be a f- people fluent in the gospel? Would we have gospel doctrine and gospel culture, which is a powerful picture and testimony of who you are? Would they be actions out of what we believe? Would you help us through the Holy Spirit to live out the gospel in us? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.